Hi Spring fans, welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. In this installment we're going to look at JDBC, yes, JDBC, the basic uh, driver layer, the database connectivity, the Java, Java database connectivity layer that we can use to talk to SQL based data sources, and I mean everything, right, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, uh, SQLite, uh, you know, Microsoft Access, I mean, Informix, uh, Sybase, uh, H2, HSQL, Derby, everything you can imagine ever wanting to talk to us in terms of, uh, uh, of SQL, uh, you can support through this uh, uh, ubiquitous and very, very well-known program model. Now, uh, while JDBC is useful and while it's very powerful, it is not, uh, of all the things that it is, it is not uh, a convenient API to use, and this has been true for 20-odd years. So uh, that's okay, right? There's a lot of ground above it uh, on which to uh, to uh, provide simplicity and power. And so the ecosystem has started to fill that gap, and one of the earliest uh, and still most versatile, and most uh, powerful entrants in that space, I think, is, is Spring. Uh, Spring has... Uh, I think some support that has actually been around since the very beginning of Spring. It's one of the earliest, uh, you know, things that we did in Spring was to simplify working with JDBC. And um, for a lot of people, including myself, yours truly, it is one of the first things that we saw as, as sort of the, uh, saw in Spring as, as, as representing utility that we would want to, to uh, reach to Spring or reach for Spring to, to be able to use, right? So um, JDBC is a, an, an old topic, but there is a, uh, seemingly no end of interest in it uh, naturally, and there's a lot of uh, really useful technologies out there that make it uh, a powerful place to a powerful way to build applications. And so today we're going to take our time and just look at a number of the different things that are supported in, in Basic Spring and uh, and some of the ecosystem. So we're going to build a Spring Boot application. We're going to talk to MySQL. I've got a MySQL database running on my local machine here. Uh, so we're going to use my, MySQL. We're going to use Lombok to make short work of creating uh, so DTO uh, entity type records today. We're going to create a, um, an application that uses the uh, JDBC support in Spring uh, and Spring Boot itself. So we're going to bring that in. Uh, and that's it for now. Um, uh, we need MySQL. Uh, I'm using a few of the default checkboxes here. There are a few options here. There's a, um, you know, a number of other different JDBases. H2 um, is supported, for example. Postgres is, is there as well. Uh, let's see if Microsoft SQL Server, there it is as well. So there's a, a number of different options that you could select out of the box, but that is by no means the exhaustive list of things that are supported by Spring, obviously. These are just uh, uh, sort of useful things out of the box. Let's go ahead and go to the downloads directory here. I think I already have a duplicate directory. So goodbye to all that. Yes, good. Take two, generate. And there's my zip file. So I'm going to open it up in my IDE. And uh, we're going to go ahead and build a simple application that talks to to MySQL. Now again, I, I've got that in my local machine. It's running under the uh, host U CRM, which is running on my local machine. And so MySQL U CRM uh, H H is equal to CRM P, and then CRM P is the uh, requires me to send a password, right? So if I do that, I am gonna show tables drop table customers drop table orders. All right, so there we are. So show tables, nothing left. Now, what I want to do is I want to build an application that can talk to my database. And uh, uh, in order to do this, I um, I could create a data source manually, right, like this. I could actually go into Spring and create a bean of type data source, like so. Uh, and this database could be, you know, it could be a data source that talks to the database. Now, naturally, in order for me to be able to do that manually, I'd have to uh, get access to the types here, so I'm going get to ri get rid of the Maven runtime prefix. I'll say data source, and I need some sort of data source implementation. Well, of course, here I could use a Spring Framework, a simple driver data source, for example, uh, like this. Um, and this is great for development, SDS, whatever, uh, like that. New simple driver data source, and it will need, in order to do its work, it'll need the uh, driver type, so we need a dri MySQL driver here, so I'll say driver equals new driver, and uh, it will of course need, in order for it to do its work, it will need, um, let's see, it throws an exception, it'll need some configuration as well, so driver.set, uh, whatever, uh, connect, URL, properties, blah, 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 and you know, you put that in there, driver, and then you put the URL, user, password, etc, 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 uh, and you return SDS, and if you get that all to work, uh, you're still nowhere even close to doing it the correct way, right? So what we have here is a simple driver data source. <coughs> the, driver da the driver data source is a data source around a driver. A driver is what you normally, it's the lowest level 
way to talk to a SQL database. Uh, a driver will get you a connection if you connect like this, right? So you give it a URL and give it some properties, and it'll give you a connection, Java, Java SQL connection, like that. Uh, and those connections are expensive. So these connections are things that you want to retain. You don't want to have to recreate them each time. Uh, this simple driver data source is just that. It's simple. It's meant for development, really. Um, and the first thing you should note is that this is not an actual connection pool. It does not actually pool connections. It just serves as a simple replacement for a full-blown connection pool, implementing the same standard interface, but creating new connections in every call. The point is, if you want to test your development, uh, this is an OK uh, idea. But as this documentation spells out very plainly, if you need a real connection pool outside of a Java E container, consider using Apache Commons DBCP or um, uh, C3PO or you know the Apache Tomcats uh, uh, got a, a connection pool or Hikari CP. So this has been around for a long time, uh, but it is not by any stretch what we're going to be using. Uh, so we would want to configure something more robust like Hikari CP or Apache Tomcat, Tomcats DBCP or, or, or whatever. Um, or Better yet, just let Spring Boot do it. So again, Spring Boot will do it for us if we ask it nicely and give it some properties. Um, if we had on the class path, if we had on the class path H2 or, C, or, or Derby or HSQL, it would automatically create those data sources for us. So um, we don't have to uh, do much to get that to work. But uh, since we, we don't, we're not using one of those embedded ones, we're going to create our own data source uh, using properties. So we go here, and we can see that we've got properties here like spring.datasource.url equals, and here, we need to tell it where to find our uh, our MySQL data source, and we get give it a username and password as well. So Spring that data source that URL username data source dot username. Okay. So let's see password. So it's CRM CRM, and the URL um, is JDBC colon MySQL colon forward slash forward slash localhost 3306 CRM and this part always gets me use SSL equals false. They added this requirement a few years ago if you're for development mode if you're not using SSL connections and you should but if you're not uh, for your local development then you have to say use, use SSL uh, equals false. Use SSL equals false. Uh, I need a host uh, as well that's in the um, URL there and we want to uh, specify a class name driver class name. And the class name will be equal to com mysql jdbc driver. And um, behind the scenes, a connection pool will configure this for us. Now, in Spring Boot prior to 2.0, the default connection pool was the Apache Commons DB, it was Apache uh, Tomcat um, uh, connection pool, uh, which is a great choice. Uh, but we've found uh, that a lot of users are having better luck with Hikari CP. So we've made that the default in Spring Boot 2.0. We think it's faster uh, and it works better. So you, you will not notice this. If anything, you'll notice that your applications are faster, right? Uh, and that's good. The other thing is that we want to initialize some data. So we're, we're going to give it some default schema uh, and a default uh, uh, data SQL file. So we're going to give it a schema.sql and a data.sql file. And Spring Boot will automatically initialize the application, the data source, with these default files. But we have to tell it to do so for every kind of data source, not just the embedded types, right? So always embedded or never. So here we go. Um, I deleted those tables. You saw me delete those tables. So now we need to create them manually. So I'm going to create a SQL file called schema.sql. And uh, we'll go to my desktop. And you can see I've got copy.data.sql, downloads, JDBC, source main resources, uh, data.sql, copy schema.sql, downloads, JDBC, source main resources schema.sql. Okay, so I'm just copying those two files here and you can see the tables that are created are are very um very simple, right? The uh, I've got uh, two types. I've got two tables, customers and orders. The uh, the two types of tables are related to each other uh, in that a customer is a one to many side of a uh, it's the one to a one to many side relationship orders is the many side of the one to many relationship so there are one customer and zero to n orders uh, that is modeled here by the foreign key um, and uh, you know that's it it's very it's very straightforward I'm using MySQL there are some nuances with MySQL that are a little different in other databases perhaps uh, so you might use serial and Postgres uh, for example um, alright so we have those things that Spring Boot's going to automatically 
uh, create those tables for us. It's going to run that schema for us when the application starts up. Now, this is probably not something that you want to happen uh, in production, for example. So you might actually want to say, you know, you might want to put this attribute here in a, uh, you know, application hyphen dev uh, dot properties, and then make sure that when you start up the application in your development environment, you activate the Spring profile called dev. So that way, it only gets run on dev and never in production by accident, because it'll, do, you know, the schema will destroy all the existing data, which is not a good idea. Uh, indeed, you might want to go a step further. You might want to take all that and then go a step further and use something like the, uh, Liquid Base or Flyway, both of which are database migration tools. So as you evolve the schema, you want to make sure that you have the, uh, the traceability to see what steps, what, what uh, changes have been made to the schema uh, and record those as evolutions, basically. One that, you know, migrations that go from one uh, schema state to the next and uh, you know that, you know, your, your development environment has um, schema up until step five, but your production database only has schema up to step two, and so the database migrator will know that the current state and the production database is two, and so when you d deploy the application for the first time, it'll apply steps, you know, or, or what they call migrations, uh, step uh, three, four, five, right? Uh, the result will be that your, your system will be brought up, to, brought up to, to, to the current state of the development code. Uh, and that gets run every single time. And, so th and there's also nice, you know, some of them are really smart. They give you ways to model rollback and, and so on. So a lot of really good support there. Now, uh, that's perhaps a video for another time. For our purposes today, this will this will get us what we want. Now, that said, we do want to take advantage, wherever appropriate. You should feel free to take advantage of your IDE support for different databases. My uh, IntelliJ has pretty good support here um, for uh, working with different databases. It even has a separate product, a whole separate product that you can uh, buy or I think there's, there might be an open source version. I'm not sure, but uh, there's certainly a version that you can buy that will um, that will let you work with your different databases. So I've got a uh, let's see CRM password test. Good. So now I'm connected, and the result of that is I get a, a console here. So I can say uh, you know show tables, run that. You can see there's nothing there. All right. So let's run this application. Just run it, doing nothing else. Just run the application. All right, and uh, when I go back to here, to my SQL console, database tools, console, okay, and I want to run the uh, the uh, query again. There we go. So I can see I've got those two two tables there, and uh, I've got some data, right? So if you look at my schema. Uh, I've got this the, the definition of the the objects in the uh, in the database and data. I've been, I've got uh, what is it now? One, two, three, six records, and I've got um, data being written, orders being written for myself, Josh, for Jane, and for Bob, and for Michelle. So Michelle has three, Bob has two, Jane has two, and Josh has three records. Okay, so some of them have zero. That's very important. We'll come back to that later. Now, what we want to do is we want to uh, exercise, you know, to build an application that takes advantage of some of the basic support in Spring Framework itself. So we're going to start simple, go with what we know, and, and work our way up um, through more interesting, more sophisticated, more perhaps exotic op options for the uh, JDBC accessing Spring developer. Um, we're going to do a lot of uh, similar demos, but uh, uh, we're going to do, you know, uh, I'm going to duplicate, I'm going to write a lot of similar things in the same code page here. So I'm going to create a little utility here just to write out the line, just write out uh, a line so that we can see where in the output we are. Uh, so line, and uh, all we're going to do is just uh, use the log for j logger there, and I'll say log dot info, and I'll just print out a line. All right, there we are. Very very simple. Now, um, let's say that in our first example. We're going to have a um, application runner. That's a bean that will start up, and it will log out uh, information in the database. Um, we're going to produce a report. So we're going to query the customers and orders count, and it's going to be an application runner. I, you know, this should be it could be a unit test or something, but we're just trying to demonstrate how different things work. So our, our application runner is going to take advantage of, uh, in this case, the JDBC template. Now the JDBC template is the uh, I think one of the most interesting sort of objects in the JDBC support in Spring. It's been around forever and a day, and uh, it makes short work of a lot of the things involved in working with 
SQL. So let's there's a you know if you look at the Spring documentation here, spring.io forward slash projects forward slash spring framework. Look at the data access documentation. Go to data access with JDBC. And you'll see this amazing rubric, this table here, that lists all the things that are required for any interaction with SQL, uh, with a JDBC SQL connection uh, and, and, and resource when you're working with uh, JDBC and all the things that you have to manage. So you have to define connection parameters, open the connection, specify the SQL parameters, or statement rather, define, uh, declare parameters and provide parameter values, uh, prepare and execute the statement, set up any, uh, set up and loop through the, uh, the result, if any, do the work on each iteration, process any exceptions, and all transactions, close the connection statement and result set, not to mention the transaction, you have to commit it. So all of that stuff is stuff that has to be done. Well, of course, Spring makes, you know, all but four of those things go away, and it calls you back wherever pro possible for the things that uh, you really should be involved with, right? So things like specifying the SQL statement, that's naturally very important. That's the thing you're here to do, right? Just to provide a custom query. Uh, you're here to uh, de define parameters that go into that SQL per statement. Fair enough, right? And you are here um, to uh, do the work. Obviously, the defining connection for each parameters, for the de defining the connection parameters, we've already done that, right? We did that here. That was, I'm not going to say it was... Uh, easy, but it wasn't hard either. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, the hardest part was actually setting up the database itself in MySQL, certainly not this, right? Um, so, we have a JDBC template, and it's, you know, it's going to do a lot of the things that we don't want to do. So let's say, string line, utils dot line, good. And uh, what we want to do is we want to query all of the data in the database and generate a report. And the report will have information about uh, each customer and how many orders are assigned to them. So public static class uh, customer order report and we'll have the string name email private int order count and uh, the long ID all right so that's the what is that the customer ID I guess we could call that to be very specific so there we are putting a detail around this report data now in order to generate that query we'll have a, a query that looks like this select c dot asterisk and I'm going to select the um, a subquery we're going to have a subquery that counts uh, the the number of orders for that for that uh, for the customer so select uh, count o dot id from orders o where o dot customer underscore fk equals c dot id right as count so let's see what we get. So now we want to run that SQL statement um, using the JDBC template. So here, JDBC template dot query. We don't want to get. We don't want to query for the whole object. There's a whole bunch of methods here, by the way. So we're going to cover some of my favorites, but most of the time I'm using query, and sometimes I use update or execute. Um, but there's a whole bunch of variants of them. So we'll talk about some of them today. So um, we'll put this in here, and the second parameter is a row mapper. Now, a row mapper is what a row mapper is useful if uh, the if the data that you're returning, if the results of the query that you're returning map one to one to an object. So, if each record in the result set maps to an object, then you should use a row mapper, right? Because you can map them directly to objects. So, I'm going to get back a collection of customer order reports like this. And in order for me to get back, get that back, and by the way, look at how smart IntelliJ is. It's now aware of the fact that I've, you know, I'm making a query against my local resource. So I can actually click on, for example, o.customer.fk or this kind of thing right here. Um, and uh, it'll be smart enough to see what I'm trying to do. So what is it saying? Unable to resolve customers. Why do you think that is? Usually it's pretty smart. Give it a second, I guess. Let's see. Close that down, and we'll open the up, up again. Hmm. Well, I guess it needs a hug. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. Either way, usually it's pretty smart, and you can actually command click on tokens in the SQL statement, and it'll uh, it'll know what you're trying to do. So now, I'm given a callback each time. It, so it's going to visit. I'm going to give the query, and then uh, it's going to loop through all the records, and it's going to call my row mapper back. This is an interface, right? Uh, and the interface, 
is a, a callback, right? So each time I get a result set, it's going to pass the result set plus the current row number, and I can do whatever I want with it, but it wants me to map that into a custom order report. So here I'm going to say, all right, uh, you know, the first one, the, the ID that comes back, let's call this uh, ID, the ID that comes back, um, and then the rs.get string name, and rs.get string email. And then rs.get long um, count, all right? So we can call this tally if you want; doesn't matter. But it has to match whatever we specify up here. Okay. So with that done, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this API is super old, right? This API was look at this. This was written originally 2001. So this is a 17-year-old API, and yet it works even better today than it did when it when it was first conceived. You see uh, these callback interfaces this this is a template object right after the design pattern the template object and uh, basically you fill it, you know you fill out the parts that matter to you and it does the rest including all the transaction management and resource initialization and acquisition and destruction all that kind of stuff is done for you and the result is you, you, you just plug in the parts that you care about well historically prior to java 5 um uh, sorry java 8 historically that that would have been anonymous interfaces like this well now these interfaces lend themselves to lambdas which I think is really, really convenient. So, uh, what do we have here? Get int. All right, look at that. It's a uh, couldn't you know couldn't have uh, ended up better. I think it's just really nice that this API just works so nicely um, with this uh, with lambdas in Java 8. So now we have the reports, and we're going to say for each, and we're just going to print out each one. All right, I'm going to use a uh, log for j logger. Okay, and this is Lumbuck. I'm using Lumbuck to to synthesize these fields at compile time, and it's as though I had written them um, myself. Okay, let's see what that gets us. Let's run this application. All right. Um, didn't give us much. Oh, there, there it is. There's our six records. Right. So there we are. We got the records. We can see that's working. We can see I got an order count two, three, etc. Right. Good. Very, very simple. Uh, you've probably seen something like that before. Let's go a little bit further, and now let's do a one-to-many. So this is actually fairly simple. Each record that we got back in the result set mapped to an object, so that was simple. Now we're going to do a one-to-many where each record uh, might have to roll up into a aggregate, our customers. So we're going to get all the customers and all the orders, and we don't want to do something inefficient. We don't want to select all the customers and then visit each one in a loop and then do a select all uh, in the database that has for all the records that match that. That would be very inefficient. We'd, do, we'd run into the n plus 1 problem. <coughs> so rather than do that, let's do a query customers and orders um, uh, example without the count. So we're going to actually get the, or the, the uh, uh, orders themselves. Okay, And same as before, we're going to use the JDBC template Okay, and we're going to use the JBC template to make the call to the database. So we're going to say um, string utils lines. Okay, and we're going to say this dot JBC template dot query select c dot id di uh, as cid o dot id as oid and O dot asterisk. Do we want uh, C dot asterisk? Why not C dot asterisk from from customers C left join orders O on C dot ID equals O dot customers F K. All right. So we're doing a left out of join here, and we're gonna get back. Uh, you know, if you can imagine it, we're gonna get back. You know, uh, let's see. We're gonna get back, you know, row, you know, um, Josh, Josh at joshlong.com, you know, uh, and then let's say one, and uh, we'll have the it'll be merged together with the results for the order. So it'll be A B C, uh, and then you know O I D will be equal to one, etc. So I'll have that, and then the next line will be largely the same, except this will be two, and this will be uh, D E F. And the next line will be G, you know, F G H I, etc. So 
all the information from the customer is here. It's on the left column, short of the last two columns. But everything after that is the order ID. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a left added join, which means that we'll get at least the information from this once. And this might be null if there's no orders. If there are more than one order, if there's one more than one order, then we'll have duplicate records on the left, right? All these, all this information on the left is duplicate, but we get the real information that we care about, the orders here. Now, as we get to another record, like this, then we'll start to see, you know, the primary, you know, this might be, what, what was it, Jane, I guess? So, Jane and Jane at Jane.com, right? Etc. So, it'll be Jane's information, uh, and she might have, you know, different orders or whatever. So, um, and there might be the same skew, okay? So, in this case, we're going to loop through all the records, and whenever one of the records is, whenever the, whenever the ID of the customer is different, as is here, we'll break. We're going to create a new aggregate object and accumulate, and, and in the meantime, as we're going through and the ID is the same, we're going to accumulate all the records into the aggregate that we've created. So, we're going to create an aggregate starting, uh, starting here, aggregate, we're going to aggregate the, cum uh, the, collect the orders, aggregate again, and so on, right? So we're going to go down the line until eventually we have all the data in a, in a collection of information. Well, that means that we have to be able to iterate through the different records until we can meet a certain criteria, which means that the result, the roadmap approach that we used before uh, doesn't quite work here. We need something that gives us the ability to iterate over the data. So here, we use a result set extractor, okay? So we're going to create a result set extractor to create a collection of customer records. So we need a uh, customer type. Um, I guess we can use this as a basis, but it's not the final representation by any stretch. Okay, customer, and we want just the ID, and we need, instead of the, uh, the count, we want a set of orders. So orders equals new hash set public static class order, private string, private long ID, private string skew, skew. All right, good, look at that. So, okay, we've got the customer, we've got the order, now, Now we've got those two things. And what we want to do is we want to create a result set extractor that visits every single one uh, of those records and, and implements this logic that we just described here. And it's a little confusing, but I think it's uh, kind of easy to understand when you kind of see it in action. So first things uh, first, we start the while loop, right? So let's start the while loop here. While rs.has next, let's visit each record. Now we have a condition, we have to accumulate. So let's get the current ID ID equals RS dot get long, uh, and that'll be the customer ID. That's the accumulate. And now we want to say while RS dot next, uh, and then we have a condition. We say if uh, the current customer, which we haven't defined yet, so we're going to create a current customer. Let's just say this one. If current customer if the current customer should equal null or uh, current customer dot get ID does not equal ID, right? And in order for this uh, to work, we also need to order this by ID, don't we? So we need to say order by CID. That way it's always going to be in that order. So RSE, there we are. Okay, and that gets us, by the way, this will give us a customer collection, just as we want. Okay, and there's our, there's our, um, and tell Jay you're kind of, com kind of confusing me today. Okay, anyway, we have this, and now um, we're saying if this has been null, if it's null, or current customer does not equal ID, then we create a current customer. So current customer equals, and we have to create a new customer out of that result set, so a new customer. Uh, and we're going to give it a result set. We have the uh, the information here. So, uh, rs.getLong CID, rs.getStringName, rs.getStringEmail, 
and then a new hash set for the orders. And we're going to add things to that as we go through. Uh, now, current customer dot get orders. Well, we have to map the current information uh, if there is any for that record. So we're going to we're going to create a order once we have our order. So we have to actually get the order out of the current result uh, and try and create it. So new order. Um, and the order is expecting an ID and a SKU. So let's do some defensive coding here. We're going to say, um, uh, let's see, rs.getLong OID and string SKU equals rs.getString SKU. So now we're saying, create the OID and SKU. So if OID does not equal null, all right, uh, is that always true? It's probably not always true. All right, I'll get long, could throw an exception, I suppose. So either way, um, we don't want to worry about that, but we want to add these things uh, to the to the current collection. So we're going to create an order, and basically we want to create it only if it's valid, right? So uh, we're going to say now current customer that get orders that add equals order, right? So there we're, we're we're looping through the data, and we're making sure that uh, as we add data, that uh, that we accumulate it into the orders. Uh, collection there now. I want to store all the customers that we've got, right? Because we're gonna we're gonna eventually hit this condition where we have to reset the customer. So we want to save the customer off into a somebody get it later on. So I'm gonna store it in terms of its in terms of the um, primary key for the customer there, and we'll come back to it later. So customers map equals new hash map. Uh, remember to change this into a concurrent map if you ever have to uh, make this multi-threaded and concurrent. All right, customer map, and if that's not null, blah blah blah, good. Uh, and then customer map. So this is gonna, we're gonna hit the same path again and again, multiple times. So in theory, we're gonna call put for as many orders as there are, which might re result in some redundant puts. But again, it's by key, so it'll never get. It's not. It's not like we're gonna add, you know, more customers of the same key. So. Uh, We'll take advantage of that later on. All right, so there we go. There's our um, uh, our, our current logic. That's our, our loop. And then finally, to return the data, we're going to say return customer map dot values. That gives us a collection of customers. All right. So what is wrong with this? While rs dot next. Oh, I don't know. Looks like it should loop to me. Hmm. Well, I don't know, IntelliJ. I think we'll have to disagree. Agree to disagree here, my friend. So we've got now this while loop. And, um, ah, that's why it doesn't loop. <laughs> You're right. So, get rid of that. And we have now our simple logic, our simple, um, logic that uh, will accumulate everything for us. Now again, this is pretty tedious, so it's a little complicated, but it sure beats um, managing all the transactions and doing this, right? So at least we're getting some gain out of this. And again, this also lends itself to being a lambda, so uh, rewrite that a little bit. There you go. There's our results at extractor. And we're going to use the results set, ex results set extractor here to get the data. So now we say customers dot for each log info. And again, we want the logger. And we get the logger by log for j 2. Okay. So there we go. Let's see what that gets us. And by the way, I want to start ordering these so that we can always see the latest and greatest uh, last since we're going to have multiple of these application runners. So let me go back and make this number 1. So it starts up first. We'll rest restart the application. And what did I do? CRM customers 
doesn't exist. Did I do that? I don't know. Oh, Kutumer. <laughs> okay, good. So, Intelligent wasn't crazy. It's me. I, I, this is now twice that I have second-guessed the ID tonight. Uh, and uh, I've been wrong. That's not good. Orders. Well, that one's clearly there. Let's see if I'm doing something silly here. Left join. Orders. Oh. Let's try it again. Source main resources, data.sql, schema.sql. Select CIDs, C.ID, PO.ID, OID. Uh, okay. Left join orders O on C.ID equals O.customers FK. So data schema customer FK. And my friend Lucas Edder, uh, he's the uh, creator of JAOQ, the Java Object Oriented Query uh, API. Uh, I'm sure is laughing at me now, saying that this is exactly why you should use type safe SQL as, as enabled through Java OQ. And he might have a good point there. So that's a good reason to go see the other uh, Spring Tip video I did on that, and uh, also my Betis, which is another um, SQL centric ORM type thing like my like uh, like Java OQ. All right, so C dot ID as C ID. Okay, let's see if this gives us the results that we're expecting. Always use your tools when you can. That looks like it's gonna work. That should be fine. So yeah, that should be exactly what we expect. So let's go ahead and now run this code again aha very cool so there we go there's our there's the result that we expected um, except what happened there RSE So in the loop, wait a minute, where's my SQL statement here? Run this again. Yeah, that looks right. So we should have, we should have, I've done this twice. No kidding. Okay. Somehow I did that twice in there. Okay, so we run this program one more time. That just looks... No wonder it was a little tedious. Okay. Uh, there we go. Look at that. So now we have six records, as we expect. But some of them have data, and some do not. So, uh, orders has an order that's zero and null. Why is that? So we're going to say if OID is not equal to null, and look at the results from this. Close that. If the customer FK is null, let's try that one. Why does it? Why is the ID so sure? that that should be non null okay id all right
Ah, there we go. Much better. Okay, so we can see empty orders, empty orders, but we have orders for the rest of them. Okay, so now we have a very simple um, example where we have a one-to-many relationship. And yeah, that was a little tedious. It was a, it took a little bit of mental gymnastics to make that work, but we understood what we're doing. And again, it's far cleaner than if we had to do it by ourselves manually. So I'm, I'm glad we had the opportunity to do this uh, because it does demonstrate what could be worse. Now, that said, this is not the only way to do this, actually. There's actually some uh, some room for improvement here, even within this example. So let's take this example one step further. I'm going to use a third-party ecosystem library called uh, Simple Flat Mapper. Okay. Now this, let's see, this example, we're going to name uh, Simple Flat Mapper. This will be ordered three. Same basic domain model. We're just going to use a third-party library here called Simple Flat Mapper, and I don't, I don't have it on the class path just yet, and there is unfortunately not a checkbox for it. Now, Simple Flat Mapper is a project uh, uh, worth mentioning. It's a third-party project uh, that um, that uh, allows you to map data, be it a, you know CSV data, XML data, whatever, SQL data, uh, and it integrates with a number of different interesting libraries out there. So, um, and uh, you know, one of those integrations, of course, is Spring. So what is it? 3.18.0, I think. There we are. So we're going to use this, and we use a simple flat mapper to make all of this terrible code go away, right? So it becomes much simpler. The code is now just a few short lines. What we're going to do is we're going to replace all that logic, all that manual accumulation logic, with a result set extractor that's created for us using um, simple flat mapper. So RSE equals JDBC template. Uh, JVC, what is it? Mapper factory dot new instance dot uh, add keys and the key is the um, ID that's the key that we want to break on right the the accumulation key and then the new result set extractor will be of type not user customer dot class all right is that right looks right new instance is it referencing the right customer looks okay to me oh it's an impla result set okay it's it's from that one in particular is it not yeah result set extractor oh that's from spring okay and basically I can I have to rewrite the queries just a little bit here to to reflect this, you know, to reflect the fact that it's um, being managed for us by this convention-based thing. Uh, but that's not a big deal. So we, what we do is we say select CID as ID, and let's write this query a little bit here. Select CID as ID, uh, C.name as name, C.email as email, uh, O.ID as orders, so again, the collection, you know, the one-to-many part, the, the many part is the collection of orders. ID of each order is called ID, so it's orders underscore ID. Uh, O.SKU as orders SKU. And uh, from customers, C, left join, uh, left join, orders, O, on c dot customer fk equals o dot id order by c dot id. All right, looks looks fine to me. Let's try this now, and we should have basically the same results as we had before. Let's see, what did I do wrong? C. Oh, sorry, o dot uh, o dot equals c dot id got those things backwards good look at that not bad uh, did I actually yeah I did so if we look at this we can see that in this case it wasn't smart enough to create null um, or to empty out the rows right so that's a little bit of a bummer. You could actually visit the records and and see if they're uh, if they're null, for example. 
Um, let's see, left outer join. Does that make a difference? I wonder if it makes a difference here. Nope, it gave us nulls, uh, which is a bit unfortunate, but um, again, you can you get 99% of that code there automatically, and all you'd have to do is to visit the results and then send that back uh, to the customer, right? So I could say uh, customer dot stream dot map and you know c c dot get uh, uh, orders dot stream you know uh, you can replace it right so you're gonna you're gonna filter each one like so and you're gonna say um c dot uh, orders dot stream dot has or uh, count like say any match o o dot get id should equal null right uh, boolean has null values if has null values you know return not has null values so basically we're going to say keep this um, filter actually we can even do a filter so if it's if it's not null, then we keep it, otherwise don't. So we get the result is a stream that we can then collect, collectors dot to set, put that into a set of updates, updated, right? And then that becomes the thing that we actually uh, keep. So here's the updated, um, did we do that right now, map? has no order values. Okay, let's see. If has no order values, then C dot set orders is equal to new hash set. There we go. That's much better. So now I just return C. Return C. Good. So that's cleaner. Okay? The result of course is now we have an updated customer set. Um, and we could even just name it customers. That's a little dirty, but again, nobody would, you know, that would hide behind code that nobody else would see. And it's still cheaper than doing an n plus one uh, query, that kind of thing. There we are. So now, empty array list. Okay, very, very fast. Now, we have a couple of different ways to write this data and to see the results. That's fine. Uh, and in this case, there's way less complexity, right? The real meat of the, the processing is there and this is you know in some cases this is actually faster um, than for example a handwritten query because uh, it's doing a lot of upfront compilation that kind of stuff so it's a you know reasonably efficient it's a as with all things it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis you have to engage in to determine whether the productivity gains are worth the performance gains I hope you'll err, err on the side of productivity of course now we have um, we have read some data let's look at look at look at reading data. So here, I'm going to use it, uh, we, I'm sorry, we've read data, let's now look at writing data. So JBC template, um, JBC template customer service, let's do JBC template uh, writer, there we go, implements application runner, and here, it's going to be a component, uh, or even better yet, a configuration, because we might create some other beans inside. It'll be a configuration type, uh, that'll have an order of what did we say the last one was three so this will be four and it'll have a logger all right so there's this and in order for us to do this we're going to need to inject the uh, JDBC writer so private JDBC template all right add the constructor arguments and here we want to write some data to the database so I'm going to create a service uh, that we can use to actually write data to the database. So, um, actually, we can. We we want to create a service here in so public static class, customer service. Okay, and all we're going to do is we're going to write some data to the database, um, and prove that it's working. So, public uh, void insert uh, string, and you know we could even do this. Uh, directly, let's use the JBC template directly first. Um, JBC template, add the constructor argument, 
and here what we're going to do is we're going to say this dot jdbc template dot uh, yeah, dot uh, dot execute right. We're going to update some data. So we're going to update, and here we have a number of different overloads. Uh, but we want to get access to the generated unique key. So we really can only use this third one here. So we create a new prepared statement creator, and then we use a generated key holder. Right, generated key holder. Okay, and the key holder we access once the write has been done. So here we're going to create the prepared statement creator. We say con dot prepare statement uh, insert into customers uh, name email values question mark question mark and uh, we say we want to write the statement and uh, we want to get the return we want to return the generated keys uh, and then we want to set the um, parameters on that prepared statement. So a prepared statement is a compiled statement that's been compiled by the engine, by the driver, by the SQL server uh, engine, uh, you know, something is compiling this so that we don't have to, uh, so that the engine doesn't have to do all the uh, syntax tree parsing uh, of the SQL query, right? Like, as you can imagine with any compiled language or with any language in general, there's a uh, preparation phase, there's a compilation phase that looks at the string and turns it into, you know, ASTs, abstract syntax trees, and then turns it into uh, op codes and then turns that into bytecode and and then caches that somewhere, right? And those 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 bytecode get stored somewhere so that they can be easily re rewritten into memory. And um, uh, in this case, it's stored in the SQL engine. So we want to this statement, this here right here, is, is telling the uh, the engine, please cache this. And uh, you know that way we can just reissue the query, but only provide new parameters. Not we don't have to recompile everything. So we're going to say prepared statement, set string one, and then the first string will be uh, you know the data that we want to write. So again, let's just imagine that we had a, a, a you know let's actually do, we can actually do that. We can actually create a service method here, public void or public customer, and we want a customer here from. Let's just do uh, this here. We'll ignore our orders for now. Okay, there's our customer type, and uh, we want to have a public void. Uh, sorry, public customer insert. I'm going to say string name, string email, and uh, we put this all in here. And now we've got that generated key holder, um, and we need we have we have we have the parameters here. So the string, the first string is the name, right, and then the second one is the uh, email. So there's this, and then finally we return uh, the prepared statement. So we're creating the prepared statement, creating the parameters, setting the parameters, uh, and then returning it. And this, of course, is nicely written as a lambda. And what do we have when we do that? Well, we don't need the actual update call. We don't need the. This is the number of rows affected. We don't actually care about that. What we care about is the um, result of this generated key holder. So we get the key, which is the number. We're going to turn that into a long value. ID of new customer, and then we can use that to look up the record or uh, or uh, or do whatever we want, right? So we could easily we could easily just say you know return JBC template dot query select uh, C dot all from customer C where C dot ID equals question mark and pass that in, and then of course um, the row mapper, so uh, new row mapper. Of type customer, and uh, we have a we have the uh, arguments, and the arguments are query for object, and the parameters go here. Is it the I'm, I'm never sure if it's the second one or the third one. Okay, so ID of new customer and. Uh, you know, same as before, right? Same as before. So rs dot get long id, rs dot get string name. Is that right? Yep. And then rs dot get string email. All right. So there we go. And that's a lambda, nicely done. Okay. So the result is that we can now um, we can now um, write data to the database and get the result back. So let's try that out here. Okay. So stream dot of 
a, b, c, that for each name, and uh, we can write data to the database. So we can say insert, and log out the result, of course. Insert uh, name, name at, uh, name dot com. All right. So we're just when we run this, we should see. Uh, then we should see what we should be able to get all the data that comes back from the database and say this that JBC template that query select all from customers and you know at this point I've got two of these might as well just reuse it so private row mapper customer all right good so now there's this customer row mapper and customer row mapper dot for each log info all right good let's run this and see what we get private final good Ah, you can see that our writer ran. Uh, I did forget something quite important, didn't I? I forgot the uh, string utils line. All right, there we go. So there we are. There's our. Um, there we are. Our uh, our existing six right there uh, in no particular order. It seems. Let me see. What did I have here? What do we have? Customer. Order by ID. That's better. Looks no, it's not actually. What's going on there? We run the application, and we have seven, eight, nine. Why do we have seven, eight, nine twice? Oh, because I'm printing out the inserts, right? So here I'm logging in the inserts. We don't need to do that. Let's just get rid of that. All right. So we know the insert. We know that it worked. That we uh, uh, there we go. So there's the the nine that we expect. Just the nine. Uh, and if I restore that code that we had before, you can see that I was able to get access to the uh, newly generated key, the key that was generated from the auto increment column there as well. So, um, you know, we could say log.info results, whatever. Okay, now, there you go, 789, these are the new, newly generated IDs. All right, so that's working, good. So now, that's a very simple example of using an insert. So we're doing, you know, all this other stuff around generating the, the results and confirming what we got. Uh, you, you know, you've seen that before, right? Very simple example of using the JDBC template. Now, the JDBC template uh, is a, uh, like I said, it, it has a nice way to write data, but uh, it's very much, this whole API is centric around JDBC template, and you have to remember this recipe, right? This whole, all of this, all that, this whole recipe for using the JDBC template, you have to repeat it each time you want to achieve the same thing with the JDBC template. It's nice to be able to wrap the stuff inside of an object and then be able to repurpose that because most people don't want to have to remember all of the different little things I had to do here to get this to work. Uh, they just want to be able to instantiate something or call something and, and get your, your data back, right? To get the data back that you uh, are advertising is available. Uh, and so for this, Spring has uh, a slightly different approach. There's actually two different hierarchies, if you will, two different uh, approaches to, to writing data using the uh, using Spring Framework. Uh, and the second strategy is around objects. So we, we've been using the JDBC template, which is in the um, which is in the Spring Framework uh, JDBC core package. Uh, sorry, JDBC package. Uh, let's see, is it core? Oh, where did JDBC template go? It's here in JDBC core, right? But there is a whole other package called object. 
and that other package lives here. And here you can see there's wrappers around operations like query, update, sort procedure, SQL calls, SQL functions, SQL queries, etc. And these are basically you, you create objects that wrap uh, the, the incantation that you're trying to do, the operation that you're trying to do. Uh, and so you can create, you can factor these different objects and then reuse them. So let's do that now, okay? So instead of doing this, let's just copy the skeleton of our previous example here. By the way, are we still in four? That's four. Okay, now five. And here, this is going to be using to be, uh, the object, JVC object writer. Okay. Good, paste that in there. And um, everything else kind of the same except for the insert, okay? And the query, actually. We're going to go ahead and redo the query as well just to demonstrate two different ways of achieving the same thing here. So, <coughs> let's um, revisit all that in a second. All right, so now we've got the insert, and we need a query, okay? So the insert, we're going to achieve using a simple JBC insert. Uh, and that's an object. That's actually a thing that we need to, to manage, right? So we can create it. So private final um, simple JDBC insert. Uh, it's going to require a data source, isn't it? So we're going to need this. We're going to say uh, simple JDBC insert equals new simple JDBC insert uh, JDBC template.get data source. Or we could have just injected the data source itself uh, with table name is customers. Uh, and we want to use generated key columns, and the generated key column is going to be called ID. All right, and we're going to store a reference to this for reuse later. And that's the, that's the nice thing about this is that uh, we can reuse these references. Right? That's the uh, these are meant to be persisted and reused over time. So, got that, got that, good. Now we address the SQL operation. And the SQL operation is fairly straightforward, actually. It's really straightforward. So we create a map containing the string and the object. Params equals new hash map uh, name, name, and uh, I always put Java 10 fixes that. I can actually, there's a builder for maps and other things. But in the meantime, I'm back in the past. So name, name email email and these map the, the keys are the names of the columns in the SQL table all right uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the insert operation this dot uh, simple JDBC to insert and I'm going to say execute and return key using these parameters and the result is the ID right so we can say long ID equals dot long value and the result of that um, is what we're going to return you know we're going to use that to return the customer now let's talk about getting that customer let's talk about that now so um, we're going to use now a different way let's you know we can come back to this in a second I suppose uh, we're going to get a uh, we're going to retrieve the customer using a SQL a mapping SQL query okay and we're going to create a generic we're going to subclass mapping SQL query to Parameterize only the thing, things that matter to us. We're gonna we need we have two different use cases here, where we want to get all the records. We want to get one by ID, and we want to get all the records after this, like as we did before, right? To do all. So we're gonna create a subclass, and that will allow us to to do that easily. So private static class uh, customer mapping SQL query implements uh, the mapping SQL query from Spring, not from uh, fl simple flat mapper. It's going to map to a customer, and in order to do this work, we need to, you know, as before, new customer. Um, rs dot get long is id. rs dot get string name. rs dot get string email, and that's it, I suppose. Okay, that's the first bit that we care about. Uh, extends rather first bit that we care about is that, but we have to also configure the data source, a SQL statement, and some SQL parameters. So I'm going to create a constructor uh, that has all these things that we care about. Okay, so data source ds 
string SQL and SQL params. Params. All right. So set data source equals data source. Set SQL SQL. Set parameters is equal to params. And uh, we need to declare the parameters. There you go. So for actually, you know what? It works if it, if I set set parameters, that actually works. So let's just leave it like that. And then finally, we need to compile it, right? And this is actually usually done for you if you call after property set. Spring will call after property set if you declare this as a bean, right? Um, so maybe it's better just to do that. But um, if you manually instantiate instances of this class and you don't let Spring manage it, you might forget to call after property set, and that would be a mistake. It in turn calls compile, and you need to do that. So I'm just going to call this by itself directly. But um, you know, you'll probably you'll probably manage these as managed beans in Spring. So with that done, now I can create them. I can create instances of them to return private, uh, let's see, private final uh, customer mapping SQL query. All will be new customer mapping SQL query. Uh, this will just load all the data. So select all from customers. And the uh, data source we're going to inject as well. So I guess we have to do this in the uh, constructor. <coughs> and um, <coughs> by ID, this dot all equals new ma customer mapping SQL query uh, DS and select all from customers. All right, and this dot by ID equals new customer get data source select all from customers where id equals question mark and we're going to de define a new SQL parameter here this is a, 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 a wrapper around the type the declared type there so we give it a java uh, types is it yeah java types dot integer and that's our implementation that's the instant instant that we need the instance that we need um, and that's it. Those are, we can reuse those now. Most of the knowledge of calling those queries, of, of running those queries, is now encapsulated in those objects, those o command objects, if you will. So I'm going to store that up here. Good. And uh, let's reuse that. So here we say this dot uh, by ID dot find object passing an ID. Good. That was easy. And for this, we say this dot all dot execute dot for each log info. Also very easy. And you can again you can easily see how you could create uh, you know for, for things that slightly differed, you would probably even create subclasses of this that already had the data source, you, you know, the constructor just contained the data source and then the SQL statement and the parameters were just done for you automatically, right? So you'd have a customer mapping SQL that only needed a data source. Uh, you know, one for all and one for a particular one, uh, for example. And for, div for 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 queries that are very different, you would definitely want to uh, just hide that as much as possible. So that way, you just have objects that you can test easily. All right. Now, um, let's see what happens. Let's see what we get if we run this code uh, again. All right. So again, it's logging the data. We don't want to do that again. It doesn't. It doesn't hurt us to show that, but it is redundant. I, I think. Let's see if we get rid of this. Get rid of that extra parentheses in the upper one as well. Alrighty. So you can see now we have ABC written again. That makes sense, right? That's we're writing them again in the second uh, application runner, uh, and that's working. So we can see that the up update worked. The JDBC object writer worked. Uh, the query worked. Right? The J mapping SQL query worked, obviously, because we wouldn't be able to get this data in the first place to see it in the console if that didn't work. So you know, same uh, same result. But you notice that we didn't actually need the data source. I used the data source to get reference to the uh, to the uh, data source. I used the JDBC template rather to get rid of 
to get pointers to the um, uh, to the uh, data source. But I could have just injected that. Arguably, I should have just injected that directly, right? So here, that's cleaner all the way. Much better. All right, so there we go, much cleaner. So this didn't need any of the JDBC template at all. You can encapsulate all that logic in these custom uh, uh, operations, if you will, operation objects. And I, I like that style. I like this uh, because it's, you know, you're, you're encapsulating the business logic here as much as possible. Okay, now, so while what we have is pretty uh, concise, uh, it's still a little bit more tedious than perhaps those who are uh, accustomed to ORM software might expect. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this up one step further and, and see if we can get the best balance between an ORM and uh, our sort of low-level SQL-based access. We're going to use a brand new project called Spring Data JDBC. Now this is by no means a GA project and I don't want to encourage you all to run out and start using it in your, in your code right now, but that said, it has been around for a while. It's been uh, it, it's a project that was uh, incubated in the community uh, and uh, it has been recently brought into the official Spring Data Umbrella uh, portfolio. <coughs> so we're going to add this project to our, our our, act, our build here. <coughs> We're going to add this product to our build in the old-fashioned way uh, using some dependencies here. So, uh, SD. So we need a few things. We need the repository in order to, to use this. So we'll add this here. And then we need the, uh, the version of the dependency. We need the dependency itself here. And uh, requisite part of that is that the Spring Data release train itself has to be upgraded. So we need to use a snapshot or at least a, a milestone. We're just going to use a snapshot for our purposes. We're using Spring Data Lovelace, so we're not using K anymore, not Spring Data K, but Spring Data Lovelace, the next release, which hasn't yet uh, uh, been released. So here we go, Lovelace, um, uh, that'll do. And with that, we can now go ahead and build a repository. So this is sh this should be very familiar if you've ever used Spring Data before. A repository is just a, uh, a, uh, a object that handles the tedious um, you know, tedious, uh, soul annihilatingly boring, tedious uh, creation, reading, updating, and deleting of, of data. And it's going to be a configuration class that we're going to have to configure first. We'll bring in at enabled JDBC repositories. And in here, uh, we can do uh, a few things. What are we going to do? We're going to create a, a um, application that uses a repository. So let's do that. We'll create a repository at repository uh, interface customer repository extends uh, cred repository here we're going to have a custom top level customer here so we're going to create a customer it'll be the top level one and we'll have IDs uh, or primary keys of type long and let's just copy any of these now I could you know I, I want to you know in, in s consistent fashion with everything else, else I've done here I would love to have all this stuff inside of an inner class but Remember, this is a bean that Spring, it's an interface that Spring needs to find, Spring Data needs to find, uh, and so because of that, I keep it at the top level because it, it doesn't look for nested interfaces, although it does look for nested components, right? Spring will do that. So we're going to have this custom interface there, um, and then custom repository and customer, and uh, and then that's it. I guess we can actually create a bean of uh, type application runner. Uh, that will use this uh, this data. So let's see here. Class. Let's create this. Make this the configuration. Make this the JDBC the application runner. All right, application runner. And here we'll use the repository, like so. component. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to visit um, all the data that comes back. Uh, and we can do this a couple ways. We can actually, let's do a, well, first of all, we let's create a custom query. So let's do a custom query. Select all from customers, C, where C dot email equals email. Collection of customer find by email string email all right uh, and our customer entity type a customer entity that we're going to manage through a uh, spring data 
uh, you know, look, it's just like that, except we're annotating it with the Spring Data Commons ID annotation. Um, and that's it. So let's see now. Let's go ahead and write some data to the database here, as before. Copy this. And we're going to say uh, visit each one of those records. And this dot customer repository at save and save a new customer null like that all right and then we want the log for j bits the logger and here I'm going to say this dot customer repository dot find by email uh, and it's going to be you know b at b dot com and we'll visit the results. Okay. And let's just confirm that finding everything should work as well. Like so. Very cool. All right, we got it. So now, uh, write the data out. Now, we're going to have an issue because the table doesn't match, right? So table CRM customer, uh, which is derived by the name of the, of the type, doesn't match anything in the database. So we need to customize the naming strategy. And here we can do that in the configuration, like so. Naming strategy. And we can just return the default one, save for one method, which will override. Get table name, OK? And we're going to say type dot get simple name dot two lowercase, suffix it with s. And we turn in this with a semicolon. OK. Now what's happening? Ah, we need to provide the method name, or sorry, the parameter name for our custom repository query. Fair enough. So at param email. I think if we had done question mark and just omitted this, it would have worked as well based on positional, param uh, you know, uh, positioning, uh, parameter, parameter positioning, but um, uh, it's fine. Okay, so there we go. There's our result. Uh, what do we say? We wanted to look for, and did I give this the right, uh, this is going to be order, what is it? I don't know. Let's just say not uh, seven. I think it's seven, five. Did I skip one? Let's do six. Okay. Alrighty, what do we got? Um, so the last one is B, right? Find by email. Oh yeah, that's true because we've inserted. Uh, here, let's just try doing a unique one. We've inserted three different ones in the course of this program, but just to be sure, save, new customer, null, uh, foo, bar. All right, there we go. So we, now, if we look for foo, or rather bar, we should get one record back. Hey, hey, look at that. Okay, so there we go. That's uh, a custom query using Spring Data JDBC. We still get full control over the queries. I wonder if this works out. I wonder if it's smart enough to um, infer the query as it does with other Spring Data modules. So let's remove the query altogether and see if it based, if it figures it out based on the name of the method, which is what a lot of the other Spring Data modules will do for you. Uh, guess not. No query specific. Yeah, okay. That's fine. We can. We don't want to give up queries when we move to this nice you know, paradigm of using queries. So, um, good. We now have looked at a number of different ways to uh, use the low-level support in, sp in Spring uh, for JDBC access. And again, this, I think, makes a fine alternative, particularly Spring Data JDBC, particularly uh, things like Simple Flat Mapper. I think um, when you start to use the low-level JDBC, JDBC support in Spring, along with the, uh, the, the JDBC template and uh, um, projects like Spring Data JDBC, you get a lot of robustness. You get a lot of speed, you get a lot of the things that we want out of our data access technology without being encumbered with a lot of code. I have written 363 lines of code, but again, I've done six different versions of the same program, right? And it's still only 363 lines of code. Um, you know, it doesn't get much simpler than that. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and uh, hope you got something out of this, and as usual, uh, we'll see you next time.